My name is Hillary Cohen. I am the Animal Control Officer for Norfolk. Uh, as you all heard, I don't remember how long I've worked here, but it's been a really long time. <laughs> um, animals, uh, wildlife stuff happens daily in Norfolk. There's, there's no way around it. We have interactions with everything from raccoons to fishers to uh, odd situations, nuisance wildlife, uh, animals that get hit by car, or you know, even in some situations like um, we had a, last year I had a woman who uh, came down into her, um, from her bedroom down into her house and she noticed that her dog was sleeping on the dog bed and then closer examination, it was a raccoon on the dog bed. Um, and in other situations, it was actually in the same neighborhood, uh, a woman thought she let her cat in at night and it was a possum. And she didn't realize this until the following morning when uh, she woke up and it was trying to crawl, climb its way out of the windowsill. Um, we see it all. We get called out for bats at two o'clock in the morning, animals struck by motor vehicles or trains, sadly. Uh, and you know the great migration of the turtles every spring and summer when they go to lay their eggs. Um, beavers, you name it, it's all out there. Uh, as we were saying earlier, we wake up at, um, you, know, you don't need to know what time I wake up, but I get into work at 7 a.m. and some nights we're not home till like 9 p.m. just because it just keeps coming at us. And um, we try to take a balanced approach as to uh, wildlife rehabilitation efforts, um, what is in each and every animal's best interest in that one specific situation. And you'll learn from Aaron, you know, there are animals we're not allowed to rehab, um, and uh, there's reasons for that. And she's gonna go into that. If you see me or Aaron, looking at our phone, it's because we're still on call and I'm the lucky one. If she gets a call, I'm going out. Uh, if I get a call, I'm going out um, because she's way more knowledgeable in the wildlife department than I am. So Erin uh, Millette has worked for the town of Millis and Medway as their assistant animal control officer for several years. And she was just promoted to the full-time animal control position for both those towns when Brenda Hamlin retired. Um, she's also been a wildlife rehabilitator for five years, five years now. And when I call Erin for assistance, I call her every, almost every time I pick something up um, because she knows the laws more thoroughly than I do. She also is much more species specific as to care. And if I ever have any questions, she's the one that I rely upon um, to give that triage until we can get that animal into a better situation. Um, there was something else I was gonna say, but I've totally forgotten it. <laughs> So I'm gonna turn this over to Aaron and uh, we'll go from there. And I appreciate you guys coming. Awesome, well thank you for having me here, Hillary. Um, and thank you, Hillary, it's ACO Appreciation Week for anybody that didn't know. So thank your ACOs and your communities. Let's get started, our wild neighbors and what we need to know to coexist with them. So like Hillary said, my name is Erin Millette, I'm the Animal Control Officer for Millicent Medway, I'm also a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. And just a little bit to touch on what I do for the animal control side. Um, first and foremost, my job is public safety and the enforcement of animal control, sanitation, public health, protecting people from animals and also animals from people. Um, I attend court hearings, whether it be for your citations or for animal cruelty cases, enforcement of local and state statutes and regulations, investigate complaints regarding animals, attend hearings for nuisance and dangerous dogs, educate the public on health and safety concerns involving animals, zoonotic diseases, animal husbandry, pick up deceased animals from roadways, impound stray homeless animals, coordinate efforts to locate owners of lost animals and adopt out unclaimed animals, maintain records and files and respond to sick and injured wildlife. And that's just to name a few. 
So let's talk about what a wildlife rehabilitator is. A wildlife rehabilitator or permittee is a person who has been issued a permit or who has been exempted from the permit requirements in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts state law for the purpose of providing care, aid, and treatment to sick, injured, debilitated, or orphan wildlife with the goal of returning such wildlife to the wild independent of human aid or sustenance. And the restrictions on that is a wildlife rehabilitation permit may not authorize the rehabilitation of endangered or threatened wildlife, uh, venomous snakes, black bear, moose, or white-tailed deer. A lot of times we get calls for um, white-tailed deer in people's yards, broken legs. Um, and unless that animal is really suffering, they can't, you know, if they're still ambulating, Fish and Wildlife wants us to leave those animals alone. Um, but however, if they can't get up and they can't move, you know, feel free to give us a call and we will um, end that animal suffering. They're also um, prey animals, so they scare very easily. So putting them in a rehab setting would totally freak them out. And they're extremely big and dangerous, so you're going to get kicked. Uh, there's just no safe way to really rehab them. And then, like I said, they habituate to humans, and a fed mammal is a dead mammal, and we can't have that. So. Um, let's talk about why animals would need wildlife rehabilitation. They could be orphaned. The mother is no longer alive to care for them or has been separated. Um, or they're injured, hit by a car, captured, or another animal, infections or poisoning. So sometimes you might see like a mother squirrel on the road and then you see some baby squirrels come down from the tree. Chances are that's a good indication if you just saw a mom in the road that those are her babies. And then this again just talks about rehabbing wildlife with a state um, permit. Again, you know, um, rehabbing it so that it can be returned back to the wild without um, human aid or sustenance. And the scope of the permit requirement uh, under the law is that nobody except with a permit shall rehabilitate wildlife without complying with the provisions of the law. So if you don't have a permit to rehab wildlife, it's illegal. So don't do it. And then there's another uh, permit. You can hold the federal permit and those are gonna be your people that take migratory birds. Uh, a federal permit issued by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or such other federal agency as may have jurisdiction shall be obtained by the permittee prior to receiving or rehabilitating any wildlife protected by federal law. Uh, this shall not preclude emergency care by licensed veterinarians, uh, salvage and rehabilitation of raptors by falconers licensed under the provisions. Um, they may only be undertaken in accordance with the law. Any costs, charges, or fees, including but not limited to shelter, equipment, labor, veterinarian, or other specialist consultation or services, transportation, federal or other licensing fees, and any other expenses associated with the rehabilitation of wildlife shall be the responsibility of the permittee. Donations may be accepted if otherwise permitted by law. So we cannot charge to rehab wildlife, and we don't get paid to rehab wildlife. So anytime we take in an animal that comes out of our pockets, um, if we have to take that animal to get veterinary care, we pay for that. Um, so just remember that. Some people get frustrated with rehabbers when they're not answering their phones. Um, they think we get paid like, hey, why aren't they doing their job? They're not answering the phone. Well, no, I am doing my job. Like I have a 24 seven, 365 day a year job. I have a family, I have my own animals to care for. So if I can't answer your phone call, then I'm sorry, but um, just be patient, look for somebody else. And if I don't have the funds to do so, then I can't take the animal. Relocation of wildlife. Uh, it's illegal to relocate wildlife in Massachusetts and most other states. Uh, no person shall transport any fish or wildlife species in Massachusetts. Exceptions to transporting and liberating wildlife in Massachusetts include a permitted Massachusetts wildlife rehabilitator may transport within Massachusetts and liberate rehabilitate wildlife. So for example, if I have something that I'm rehabbing and they're ready for release, I can put them in my car and bring them to the release site. Um, and a permitted Massachusetts problem animal control agent may liberate problem animals at the site of capture or may transport within Massachusetts such animals to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator for the purposes of euthanasia. So a problem animal control agent, which is what we call a pack agent, those are gonna be like your wildlife trappers, your nuisance removal. A lot of people think when they call them, they're just gonna take this animal away, release it somewhere else, and they're gonna have such a great life. No, they can't. So they can either A, like I said, take it to a rehabber, they have to euthanize it, or when they take it out of your chimney, they have to release it right at your house. But there's no relocating it, you know, down the street, in the woods, and... Um, can you explain why? Yes, well, I'm going to, oh. yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you why. There we go. The relocated animal may try to return to its original area and may be hit by a vehicle. Squirrels, raccoons, and other wildlife can return 5, 10, or even 15 miles away. So 
Um, within the scope of my permit, I have to release the animals that I take in within five miles within the uh, point of capture. So a relocated animal will have the more difficult time finding food, water, and shelter in a new unfamiliar place. If the animal can't find these necessities, it will be stressed and may die. If food, water, and shelter are available in the new site, chances are that site will then already be occupied by other members of the same species that they will not welcome a newcomer in their territory. They may drive the animal away or even kill it. If the relocated animal is carrying a disease, it may spread that disease to other animals in the area. Rabies is a special concern. So we see that a lot like with distemper um, and rabies. You know, we tend to pick up animals like in the same general area. If the conditions on your property are particularly attractive to the animal and you move it out, other animals may move in to replace it. So if you take a raccoon out of your chimney and you don't put a cap on it, you just you know, call a pack agent in to get, take the raccoon, um, then as soon as you take them out and whether they're euthanized or whatnot, you don't put a cap on your chimney, then something else is just gonna come in. So you have to fix the problem. You can't just remove the animal something else sheds. sheds yep uh same thing like if you have you know skunks living underneath your deck if you take those skunks out and you don't put any lattice or anything like that then something else is going to move in there so you have to actually fix the problem a lot of people don't don't realize that and you could also separate a mother from its babies causing the babies to die if you pull out that raccoon in the chimney or whatever and you don't look for babies or whatnot then you know you could possibly orphan those babies and they could die. So the birds with the Massachusetts state permit, all these, um, the birds that we as a state um, permittees can, can rehab are the mute swan, the turkey, the European starling, the rock pigeon, the rough grouse, the ring neck pheasant, the house bear, and the bob white quail. Any other birds you find, you need to contact somebody with a federal permit. So when you go to that list on mass.gov, look for somebody with a federal permit if it's not one of those birds. Um, and the mammals with the state permit, we can rehab any mammal. These are just, you, these are the most common ones that you're gonna see around your house. Uh, your cottontail rabbits, your eastern gray squirrels, your red squirrels, your flying squirrels, your eastern chipmunks, your opossums, raccoons, skunks, and mice. Um, all of your other carnivorous mammals, your foxes, your otters, your fishers, uh, coyotes, things of that nature, we have to call Fish and Wildlife and get special permission to take those animals in. Uh, but we can take them as long as we have permission. And your eastern cottontail rabbits, they have a gestation, pay, uh, gestation period of just 28 days. They breed from February to September. They are herbivores. They eat plants, grass. Uh, they nest in shallow depressions in the ground covered with fur, grass, and leaves. So you've got to be careful mowing the lawn because you hardly ever see them. It may look like a pile of dead grass. Uh, the mother feeds twice a day at dusk and dawn. Um, so you, she doesn't stay on the nest to, draw, uh, to avoid drawing predators, so you won't likely see her, and the babies leave the nest around three to four weeks. So she literally will stand like, like she's standing in this picture here. She could have a nest under there, and she's going to stand just like that. So you wouldn't even know if you're just looking out your window, and you're like, oh, there's a bunny in the yard. Unless you know for sure that there's a nest there, you wouldn't know that she's feeding. Um, and she'll stay there, she'll nurse, and then she'll leave. And those babies just stay in that little nest and they're, they're totally fine. And then all of a sudden they'll be gone. And so what to do if you find a nest or your pets bring you bunny? Everybody plays with these bunnies, dogs, cats. Um, so they are hard to see. They look just like this. Um, and when mom is done feeding, she'll cover this back up very lightly with some, with this nest material. Um, if bunnies are the size of an orange or a dollar bill, they are fine on their own. Return them to the area of the nest where they were found. So they are very small at like three to four weeks, like I said, when they are on their own. And a lot of times people be like, oh my God, I have this baby bunny. It's like frozen in my hand and it's not doing anything. That's because it's petrified of you. And it's totally fine where it is. So if it's like this big, like the size of an orange, put it back where you found it underneath the bush or whatever and leave it be. It's totally fine. It can eat grass and it's good. Um, when to seek help. When bunnies are hairless and out of the nest, they look like little gray hippos. Um, they're cold and lethargic, covered in parasites, have been in a cat or a dog's mouth. Cats carry a bacteria called Pasteurella, which is like uh, deadly to wildlife. Broken limbs, cuts, abrasions, or head tilt, bleeding, difficulty breathing, fur is ripped from skin or puncture wounds. We call that like degloving. A lot of times the cats or the dogs will um, rip their skin like their fur like totally off and degloving. 
Uh, what to do next, if you think the bunnies are orphaned, you can place a tic-tac-toe pattern with string, yarn, dental floss, or even like sticks I use uh, over the nest to see if it's disturbed the next morning the mother has been to the nest. So you'd want to do like it shows you here with the tic-tac-toe pattern. If you come out the next morning and that was disturbed because the mother will come, she'll kick all that material away, she'll nurse, and then she'll just kick it all back over. Uh, if it's still obviously like that, it means she hasn't been back. Um, but if it's been disturbed and those babies look okay, then chances are she's been back. Um, keep pets away from the nest, place a laundry basket, wheelbarrow, lawn chair, any other object over the nest that will allow the mother to get to the bunnies. Um, mother rabbits will not move their nest, so it's not like you can say like, oh, I'm gonna move it over here and she can nurse over there and she won't pick up her babies and move them to another location like other mothers will. She won't, so you, you can't do that. And if um, she doesn't come back, it's not, she's not gonna take them and move them. Um, and again, they won't be there only around three weeks. So put your dog on a leash. I know people get like so aggravated. They call rehab. It's like, oh, I have these bunnies and my dog found them and I just can't deal with it. Like, I don't want to put my dog on a leash and, you know, whatever. And it's like, well, ideally, we cannot take wildlife if it's healthy. There's nothing wrong with these bunnies. They don't need rehab. You just don't want to put your dog on a leash or you don't want to put a laundry basket or a wheelbarrow over it to cover it. So, um, you know, I won't take them. There's nothing wrong with them. You know, then people get mad. Or, so something easy like this, you can just yeah, if you a little bit like, bigger. Yeah, if you just cut a, uh, like mm -hmm. a little horseshoe yep. out and then put a little rock on top. Mm -hmm. So you have like a little dog. Yeah. Uh, uh, that way she can get into her business and mm -hmm. nobody else can eat the bunnies. Yeah. So. That would be good. Yep, and the wheelbarrow, like I said, at Medway Dog Park, somebody called me last year and they were like, oh my God, my dog just dug up baby bunnies. I'm like, oh, perfect spot, like at the Medway Dog Park. <laughs> so I said, let me come up and see. And they had like a nice little dog park committee there and they had a wheelbarrow there. So I said to the people, do you come here like all the time? And they're like, yeah, we're here like every day. So there's only two people there. So I took the wheelbarrow and I put it enough so that mom could sneak under into the hole. And, um, I went back like a week later and those bunnies were still there and they were still there because number one, only two people knew about it and the dog's going to get to it because if everybody in that dog park knew, they'd be picking at those bunnies and playing with them and then it would just have turned sour. So mm -hmm. that worked out good. And the dogs like didn't even know I was there when the dogs were there like the, the week later and they had no idea what, like, what the heck was going on. Uh, squirrels, their gestation period is around 45 days. They can breed twice from February to September. They are omnivorous. That means that they, they eat like everything, uh, a little bit of meats from like little snakes sometimes to um, little lizards or stuff like that. Generally they don't, but they tend to eat more nuts and fruits and berries and things like that. Uh, they nest in trees. Their nests are actually called drays. They look like uh, those big round leafy things that you see at the top of all those trees. Um, they're on their own at about 14 weeks. Infant squirrels can fall from the nest if uninjured try to reunite them with their mothers. Mothers will come back and take them or move them if the nest is destroyed. So squirrels usually make two nests. She always gets the backup one. Uh, place a basket either on the ground or securely in a tree like you see here in these pictures. Um, and the babies have to be warm or she won't take them, but she will, she will take them. I've actually seen it like in person because um, I have a nesting box outside my house and watch them. I just couldn't figure out how to get it into the PowerPoint. Oh, <laughs> I know everybody hates them, but they're so cute. Um, they have a gestation period of 31 days. They're born from March through September. They are omnivorous, the same like the squirrels. They nest in burrows under the ground and they're on their own at about 12 weeks. Um, so they build a nest deep in the ground. If you see one, like that was dug up and it's outside of the nest, chances are it's probably orphaned, uh, but it's always good to get them on heat, leave them outside, you know, in like a box or something to see if the mom will come back. And then these guys are so cool. Virginia possum, they are North America's only marsupial. Cool fact about these babies is um, they have a gestation period of just 13 days, so they're actually born embryotic, the size of a bumblebee and they swim up the birthing canal and she only has 13 nipples so if she has more than that so they swim up the birthing canal and they go into her pouch and they actually swallow the nipple and they stay on it continuously for another uh six weeks so if you're number 14 you're in big trouble because you're not going to survive um so they'll stay in her pouch they'll continuously nurse um and then they will come out and they will ride on her back 
Um, these guys are also omnivorous. We call them nature's cleanup crew because they'll eat anything from insects to carrion, which is dead animals, um, to fruits, vegetables. They are nocturnal. Um, they're on their own at about 16 weeks. Um, and they nest usually in hollow trees or under buildings like your porches and stuff. Any baby that's found that's less than seven inches from the nose to the base of the tail, not the tail, but like to its butt, um, usually need a rehabilitator. And they don't have a strong maternal bond. So you can see here, she's got them all on her back. So if she loses one and she's walking around, she generally doesn't know that she's lost one and won't go back for it. So if you see one by itself, chances are it needs some help. And these striped skunk. These guys have a gestation period of 63 days. They're born from April to August. These guys are also omnivorous. They are mostly nocturnal, but they may be seen in the early morning or evening. Um, they're on their own at 12 to 14 weeks. They are a rabies vector species, so be sure to wear gloves and limit contact. Since mother skunks like to keep their babies with them, skunk babies seen alone are likely orphaned. As with other animals, waiting to see if the mother returns is a good strategy. Place the babies in a shallow box or overturned laundry basket. So usually these guys are really kind of cool because you'll see like mom and then you see like all these little skunk babies like falling around like in tow. Um, so they're kind of fun to watch. And then raccoons, they have a gestation period of 65 days. They're born from March through June. The mother can have one to eight babies in one litter. These guys are omnivorous too, they eat everything. They are nocturnal, but mothers can be seen out in the day, especially during baby animal season. Um, they're on their own at about 20 to 24 weeks. And a lot of times these guys will stay with their mother until like the first year. And then when she has her second litter, um, you know, the following spring, they will take off on their own. Um, they nest usually in tree hollows, chimneys, attics, and barns. Uh, they are a rabies vector species, so wear your gloves and limit contact. Try to, try to reunite the babies with their mother. Place the babies in a container close to where the nest was originally. Mothers will travel the same path. Try to place the babies in her path. And remember to keep the babies warm and out of the way of predators. And fishers. Not fisher cats, fishers. The fisher is one of the largest of the weasel family. The males weigh about 8 to 16 pounds. The females weigh about 4 to 6 pounds. They measure... About two feet in length in both sexes, and they breed from February to March. They produce a litter consisting of one to four kits with an average of three. Their maternal dens are generally located high in a tree cavity, and then at about eight to 10 weeks, they are moved to a den below ground. The kits are nursed, and that's to, they're up high in the tree to kind of avoid them from predators, and then when they're a little bit bigger, she puts them in a below down, a below, a den below ground. The kits are nursed until four months of age. At five months of age, they are the same size of an adult female and can successfully kill their own prey. And they disperse late summer, early fall and live solitary lives. They reach sexual maturity at a year old and the females produce their first litter at two years of age. And these guys actually have a delayed um, implantation of their fertilization. So these are actually Hillary's Fisher babies from last year. There were three, four, I believe there were three three, total, yeah, three. And I was trying to take a hike on a Saturday yes. and I got a really um, scared resident phone call calling 911. And I knew I was up on Noon Hill in the woods, so I called Aaron. Who better? I mean, Fishers, right? I figured it would just be something simple like shoo them back, mom will find them. But she'll tell you, you know, what happened at that point. Well then, so I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Fisher baby's like, whatever. I got there and I didn't see them. So I was going up to tell the resident that I was there and they came at me in three different directions. And I thought they were gonna kill me because they were like, Wah! and they had these big claws and big sharp teeth. And like a couple weeks before we had had a rabid raccoon Correct. baby that did the same thing to me that came at me flying out like, Wah! And I'm like, oh, looks just like the rabid raccoon. And I didn't have anything in my hands to protect myself. So I'm like, oh my God, I jumped on the hood of my truck. The resident probably thought I was a crazy person. And I called the, somebody that specializes in these guys. And she said, no, no, leave them alone and, you know, see what happens. And sure enough, we did find mom deceased in the roadway. So Hillary wrangled these guys up and got them into rehabilitation. And one of them survived. Right. Yeah, one had pneumonia, one of them survived, and one we were, she was unable to capture. And when we capture wildlife under mass law, we're not allowed to use traps. It has to be either by gloved hand, 
a huge net or a catch pole like you see in, in the TV shows. That we call them control poles, rabies poles. But you are not authorized except when you have special permission by the state to use a trap. Totally off limits. They make us work for them. Mm -hmm. And then the red fox, um, these guys are susceptible to mange, and that's one of our biggest calls that we get all the time. Um, mange is caused by a sarcoptic mite that burrow into the skin. It causes itching, scratching, and increased inflammation. Uh, it can be transferred to dogs, so that those of you that give your dog like heartworm medication, ivermectin, um, that treats it. It is illegal for rehabbers to trap any animal, so like Hillary said, so it's they're not easy to catch, um, and by the time they are catchable, they're highly debilitated and um, you know not doing well at that point. So a lot of people will say like, oh, I'm gonna leave out like a meatball of ivermectin for the fox. Well, let me tell you why that's not a good idea. So ivermectin is uh, based on weight, so that's all fine and well, unless you actually sit there and watch that fox consume it. So number one, you don't know how much he weighs. You're just guessing. So you could either A, overdose him or B, underdose him. Number two, um, you're going to need more than one dose to treat him. He's going to need several doses. Uh, number three, he's probably going to need an antibiotic because they usually get a secondary bacterial infection. So that's going to need to be treated. Um, number four, ivermectin is um, not... Uh, Again, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. It is, I don't want to say poisonous, but um, like... Toxic. Toxic, thank you. To like um, your border collies and Australian shepherds. So if he didn't eat that and ran away and then it was left out there and another dog came along and ate it, uh, you could potentially poison those animals. Uh, what happens if the squirrel decides to come along and eat that? Now you've overdosed the squirrel and now he's got neurological um, issues and probably will die. So that's why you can't do it. That's why it's illegal. So uh, don't do it. And gray foxes really get mage because it, the mite doesn't live long on them. So this is a healthy red fox up top, and obviously this is a fox with mange at the bottom. So I apologize. The next picture is kind of graphic, so if you don't want to look at it, don't look. Um, this is actually a red fox that I just picked up in Medway. The fox is still alive in this picture. That's how debilitated he was. I was actually able to pick him up with a towel. Um, he was literally skin and bones, literally skin and bones. So um, I did not take him in for rehabilitation in my professional opinion. Um, I thought that would be cruel to endure his suffering any longer. Um, so I did humanely euthanize him. But you can see the pressure, sore, pressure sores here, you know, just from being so, um, skinny and laying on that area and then he had mange like all over his body with just basically running down the middle of his body he only had fur but I could smell the infection on him like he stunk I could just smell it so again mange is not what kills them he had such a bad infection and he had succumbed to starvation and that's what killed him not the not the mange and then coyotes. Uh, so these guys can be seen at all hours. They are mostly nocturnal, but they also hunt at dusk and dawn in places with few, few humans. They will hunt during the day, especially when feeding pups. So these guys are out like all the time. They've become so accustomed to humans um, that they've learned to adapt. So coyotes are usually shy, but if, if they approach, make a lot of noise and act large to scare them away. Attacks on humans are rare. Seven recorded coyote bites on humans in the past 65 plus years in mass. Two of them were confirmed rabid. So more people are killed by cattle every year. You just don't hear about it because that's not exciting. Um, and there's actually more dog bites um, probably in a day <laughs> than there is this in 65 plus years with coyotes biting people. So coyotes can be creatures of habit. So if you see one at the same time and place while walking your pet, change your route or timing. If you have a small dog and encounter a coyote, pick up your pet. If you notice one pair of coyotes following you, they are escorting, escorting you or shadowing you through your territory to make sure you don't bother their dens. So especially like this time of year, they have pups in their dens. So they don't den normally. They only den, same thing with foxes, when they have pups. Other than that, they live, you know, wherever they don't have, like they'll just kind of sleep wherever they don't have like a, a den that they particularly stay in. So um, they will kind of stalk you to watch you to say like, hey, you need to, you need to go. 
So this is my dog, Harley. And this is a measurement of her laying down. I apologize, it's kind of like a bad picture. But um, what do you guys think Harley weighs? How yes. tall is Harley? Like, like on your leg, would it be like your knee? Harley's probably, what do you say, Tim, like up to here? Yeah. Yeah, she's probably up to here, I'd say. 48? 28? I'd say 50. 50? Anybody else want to take a guess? 60. 60? Okay. So that tape says 18 inches. And this is a coyote that was picked up in Foxboro. Um, so the tape here measures 20 inches long. So this coyote is only 2 inches bigger than Harley. This coyote weighed in at 25 pounds. How much does Harley weigh? Harley weighs 33 pounds. Wow. Their coat is so thick, like it took me like forever to get through its coat to actually get to its body, to feel its body. And we measured its canines and its paw pads and everything. It was like the same as a dog. So essentially they are a wild dog. Um, they're not these big beasts that everybody makes them out to be. Like they have all the same characteristics that your dog does. They're just wild. So this one, this one was hit by a car. But what better way than, he was totally like intact and everything, everything was fine. But we said, what a better way to you know, actually, because people will call and they'll say, I saw a coyote, he had to be 75 pounds. They're not. They're generally like 25 to like 45 pounds. And the same thing with fishers. They say it's definitely 30, 35 yeah. pounds. And it's just the way they, they wear their fur. They, they um, look muscular. So much bigger than they actually are. Yeah, so they get hands on. Yeah, they're really like, and they're just all muscle. Mm -hmm. They're lean. Um, but these guys, yeah, they're not big. They're not that big. Their fur makes them look big. And then bats. Uh, you may find bats in houses. They can squeeze through a half-inch hole. Um, if any person or pet may have had contact with the bat, it will be necessary to capture the bat and have it tested for rabies. So, let me just touch on you people that have indoor cats that don't think it's important because your cat stays indoors and you don't need to have it vaccinated for rabies. So number one, it's state law that all cats and dogs and ferrets are vaccinated for rabies. Number two, if you have a bat in your house and then you call me because you need me to come get the bat and then I tested for rabies and it comes back positive and you can't prove to me that your animal has had a rabies vaccination and it's positive. The state usually generally wants you to euthanize that animal because you can't tell me that your cat didn't play with that bat or get bitten by that bat. So it's just, you know, I never thought of that either until I started doing this job, but that's just food for thought. Um, if you have direct contact, a bite, scratch, or other physical contact, uh, possible contact, an unattended child, a person who was sleeping, a person with sensory or, sensory or mental impairment, or a pet. So um, these type of people, uh, sleeping people's, sleeping people's, <laughs> a sleeping, <laughs> A sleeping person because you don't know if you were bitten while you were sleeping, um, all those types of things, we would come, we would take the bat and test it for rabies. If you happen to be sitting in your living room and all of a sudden you see the bat flying around and you knew that you were awake and you did not get bit by the bat, then you can just open the door and say, see you later, bat. If you saw it flying in yes. through a window, right. if you just saw it, oh my God, there's a bat on the floor and you didn't see it come in, right. then we want to test that bat because yeah. rabies is... is well, 99.999% fatal if transmitted at the, the correct time between the, the host animal and humans. So we, we value human life, so of course we're going to test that animal. Any, any wild animal that, that needs testing, mm -hmm. um, we got to keep everybody alive. Yes, any mammal can contract rabies. Um, and even the possum, mm -hmm. even though you see stuff online that they, they say that they're marsupials, they, they don't get rabies, they, they can. can, it's rare. Um, to allow a bat to leave your home, close the room and closet doors, open windows, turn on a light and observe the bat until it leaves. Be sure to close the windows once the bat has left. Only 5% of bats submitted for testing are rabid, so it's very low. So don't think they're like these blood sucking, get caught in your hair, like rabid things anytime you see them, because it is very rare. Um, and don't damage the head, because it could make it impossible to test. So whenever we test an animal for um, rabies, we need the, the brain matter.
Yeah. Quick question. Is the uh, percentage for um, testing for rabies, uh, positive testing for rabies, the same in, in the other vector species? Like, you know, when they have to test raccoons because someone picked them up or whatever? And I think there's actually postings online, isn't there? Doesn't the state post, like, how many animals were submitted and the positivity rate? They do. They, they usually come out with a monthly and a quarterly to animal control or just a state level as to what they've tested and how what the percentage rate of what the testing came back at. Um, but the state, if, if anybody has had any unprotected exposure with wildlife uh, and there is even the possibility that they were bitten, scratched, uh, saliva, uh, cross-contamination, the, the state's saying test that animal. Right. The state also has a state epidemiologist that's on call 24-7, so you can call that number if you thought you had an exposure or had a concern. You can call them, you can tell them your situation, what happened, and the state epidemiologist will advise you if they think that you need post-exposure shots or, you know, um, there are certain animals like chipmunks and things like that that sometimes they'll say don't test because they're so low uh, that chances are if they would be bitten by a rabbit animal that they would be dead. Yeah. They would be eaten, you know, if a coyote goes to eat a chipmunk, chances are it's going to actually eat it and not just bite it and drop it. But again, that's what they're there for. That's their specialty. So you can always call, you can always call them. But I will tell you that the percentage of animals from what I've seen on the stats are low you know, from what has been tested in. Oh yeah, same thing with like woodchucks. They're, right. they're much lower on, on the rabies positive. The skunks, the fox, the fishers. I mean, we don't test a lot of fishers. Right. Um, raccoons, bats, those are like your, your big ones that people send in most often. Right. And I would just say, like I'm saying, like most animals that are sent in majority of the time don't come back. So let's just say like, one out of five, maybe. Right. It's not, you know, this huge five out of five. Um, so this is a perfect example when to call your animal control officer. So a lot of people just call and say, like, I have a groundhog in my yard. Well, that's great. Like, what's it doing? Because if it's acting normal, I'm going to say that's awesome. Like, enjoy it eating your flowers or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Nothing I can do. So animal control cannot remove healthy wildlife from your home. Um, if it's circling, falling over, staggering, has hind limb paralysis, it's lethargic, it has discharge from its eyes, nose, or mouth, self-mutilation, oblivious to noise or nearby movement, erratic wandering or seizures, uh, sometimes raccoons or skunks will vocalize excessively. Those are all signs that you want to call us because uh, something's wrong with that animal. And then another issue is diseases and poisons. Uh, wildlife can harbor an array of diseases. Some can be transmitted to humans. Those would be called zoonotic diseases and certainly to pets. Always wear gloves. Uh, diseases can include rabies. That's like we talked about. That's transmitted through saliva, a bite or a scratch. Uh, parvovirus contaminated um, and that's spread through contaminated environments or feces. So a lot of your dogs are already vaccinated against that. Uh, so those, a lot of the animals that carry that are like your skunks and your raccoons. Uh, Bayless ascaris, which is fecal oral, that's raccoon roundworm, um, and that is zoonotic. Salmonella, uh, touching infected animals or feces eating contaminated food. So those are going to be like your reptiles and amphibians that carry salmonella. So if you're touching turtles, wash your hands. Uh, leptospirosis spread through urine. Listeria is contaminated food. Lyme disease through a tick bite. Your hantaviruses, which is your rodents, urine, feces, and saliva. Uh, tularemia is going to be your rabbits, muskrats uh, from infected animal tissue. Uh, mange, which is a mite in direct contact. Um, and the equivalent of that would be like scabies for humans, if you get mange from a uh, fox. And then we have other deadly problems for wildlife, rodenticide poisoning. That's a big um, thing now, um, anticoagulant. Rodenticide poisoning, uh, commonly used for pest control chemicals, affects birds and mammals. So that's great. You have uh, mice in your house. You put down some um, rat poison. They come, they eat it. Now they're thirsty, so they go out and they look for water. And the little mouse is kind of just doing this outside because he doesn't feel well. And now the hawk sees him. The hawk says, easy meal, comes down and eats the mouse. Now um, the hawk has... Uh, poisoning from eating the mouse and now the hawk is dead because he's eaten about 10 of these from previous 
And now the coyote goes, oh, dead hawk, easy meal. So now the coyote has secondary anticoagulant rodenticide poisoning. So it just keeps on all of our natural uh, rodent control is being taken out by this stuff. So I suggest using like a snap trap or something like that. Lead poisoning from bullets, pellets, old fishing gear uh, affects your waterfowl, which would be like your swans and your geese and your duck if you're leaving your um, lead sinkers and stuff at the bottom or when eagles are eating deer carcasses and things like that, the lead shot from the bullet, a lot of them come in with a high um, positive lead rate. And then nesting birds, newborn baby birds are called hatchlings. They're newborn with, uh, at two to three days old and have little or no feathers and their eyes are closed. Uh, they're birds with fluffy down are called nestlings. Uh, they're three to 12 days old and they have fluffy down with their eyes open usually at three to five days. And a nest is usually three to seven hatchlings. Fledgings are 13 to 21 days old, learning how to fly and self-feed. They are often found hopping around on the ground. Mom is watching from a distance. Um, and depending on the species, they're about the size of a walnut in a shell when hatched. Some can be as small as a shelled cashew. Fledglings leave the nest at about three to four weeks. They're about the size of a standard orange and have lost nearly all their down. Fledglings do not need to be rescued. These are another thing that everybody kidnaps. I uh, found a baby bird. Um, they should be left alone and to learn how to fly and pets should be kept away from them. The parents will come back and get them once they have worked for their food. So up top, you can see the hatchlings, and then these are your nestlings. And then on the bottom here, this is your fledgling. So if you see a little bird like this hopping around your bushes, leave it be. Mom's up in the trees, and she's watching him, um, and she's feeding him. And then what to do with the bird's nest. If the nest is salvageable and there are any hatchlings or nestlings outside the nest, return them to a nest. Um, if the nest is destroyed, reconstruct a nest or replace it with a similar structure. Replace in the location where they originated and observed from afar to see if mom returns. Um, the scent thing is a, is a myth. Like, just because you touch it, the mom won't return. That's, that's just a myth. She will come back. Um, they come back about every 20 minutes, and the baby should be left there as long as it isn't dark or cold. Baby should not be left overnight if the parents do not come back because they're out during the day, so they're not going to come back at night. So if she hasn't come back... Take them in, warm them up, um, and then put them back out in the morning to see if she comes. So you can use a plastic bin or other container. So we sometimes you use like a margarine container or something. Um, a felt small knitted hat or a warm cloth. No big loops, um, nothing big like loose towel strings that can wrap around their necks or their little feet. Uh, put a heating pad on low or a hot water bottle wrapped in a towel for ambient heat, not direct. Um, and no original nesting as it may contain, contain mites. So what do we do if we find these little guys? Um, we're gonna wear gloves, we're gonna pick up the animal and place in a container or box with a soft towel or a cloth. Um, so what you can use is if you have a box or something, you can poke holes in it, use a cardboard box. These you, like I got the dollar store and I made my husband drill some holes in it and I use these as like a nice incubator, keep them nice and warm. You never wanna put the baby directly on heat. So these are uh, snuggle safes, most of you aren't gonna have them. They're, they work really, really well. But what you can do is if you have a, like an electric heating pad, you always want to put it on low. And then you're going to put the container on top of the heating pad. And then for those of you that don't have anything like this, what you can do is um, this is just like a regular old heating pad. You can heat it up, put it at the bottom of your container with a towel over it. Then you're going to take your baby and put him in another towel on top so the baby's never going to go directly on heat you don't want to burn them and you don't want to cook them so the problem um, you can use hand warmers if you don't have um, a heating pad this is just another like heating pad here you can use if you don't have anything you can use a hot water bottle um, and i did have a sock filled with rice but that's in my truck because i was using that and um, the only problem is none of these things stay warm for very long, so you just have to keep an eye on them and um, keep on reheating them if you have to, um, unless you have an electric heating pad or something like this. Always wear your gloves. If you have garden gloves, those will work. If you have just regular old nitro gloves, those will work. Um, and so these babies can't thermoregulate. So they can't maintain their body temperature, so they get cold very, very easily. 
So you have to keep them warm. That's the most important thing. Warm, dark, and quiet. Do not feed them because if they are hypothermic, they can't digest food. Their body will try to absorb that food when it needs to use its, uh, all its energy to keep itself, try to keep itself warm, and then it will just shut down. So um, plus you could feed it the wrong thing. It could aspirate. So just don't feed it. And there's so many different opinions on oh. Google as to what you feed each type of animal. Oh, yeah. I would say 90% of everything out there is, is not correct. Oh, yeah. I took some screenshots because somebody found baby squirrel. And I actually screenshotted them um, for tonight because it got so crazy of how dumb can you be how, if you can't take a cotton ball and dip it in milk and feed the baby. Well, number one, we don't feed it milk. Um, the other one was... You can use um, puppy formula. Yep, I saw that. Um, you can use puppy formula, and then the other one said, no, I'm a rehabber, you can't use that. Which, for this particular animal, you could use that, so I was like, okay, you're not a rehabber. But anyways, like it just went, I was reading all the comments, and I was going like cuckoo, like, listen, and finally one lady said this, wear gloves, place in a warm, dark, and quiet area, and call a rehabber. I was like, thank you, listen to this lady. The fail safe like, whenever I call Aaron is just like dark, <laughs> secure, warm, no food, no water, get it to a rehab. The most important thing is warm. Like they have to be warm. Have to be warm. And these are just some skunk dog recipes. Um, I know one ACO like swears by douche. She buys it in bulk. Hillary and I like white vinegar. They sell skunk off, like I've seen it like in Petco and stuff like that, uh, you can get that. And a lot of people do hydrogen, bake, hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and, and dish soap. I do that sometimes before I use the, the vinegar or after, I should say. Um, turtles crossing the road, always pick a turtle up from the rear and move it to the side of the road in the direction they were going. So don't ever like pick them up and face them the other way. They know which way they want to go, especially like moms um, going to lay her eggs. She knows where she wants to lay them, let her go that way, and then she will turn around and come back when she's done. Um, and you can lift them up like this guy is here on the back. You could take a shovel if you wanted to, if you were scared to like pick up like a snapper or something. Um, you could take your car mat and drag them across. You can pick them up and um, Carry them depending on the size of the snapper, just like a platter. Um, Not in Norfolk, right? They're huge. Yeah. <laughs> so um, definitely wash your hands after you touch these guys to carry salmonella. And um, baby turtles do not need help if you see a baby turtle. So um, they are born um, precocial, meaning that. Um, once they're born, they're like ready to go. So she goes and she lays her eggs, she covers them up, and then she says, see you later. So once they hatch, they just find the pond or wherever they're going, and they live their merry little life. So they don't need, um, they don't need any help. Turtles in trouble. This, this turtle is still alive. The shell is like bone and can be mended. Please take any turtles with the correct shells to a wildlife center. So this is all bone. Uh, turtle shell is bone, just like me or you. If you break your leg, just like a turtle cracking its shell, it needs to be fused back together. They do take uh, double the time to heal, uh, more so than mammals do. So if it's six months, they'll take a year, year and a half. Um, but I've seen some pretty impressive like shell, shell jobs that they've, that they've mended. Um, but they do have organs and stuff inside here, just like me and you, liver, spleen, all that stuff. So um, depending on if those aren't damaged from, from being hit by a car or whatnot, they can be saved. Saving and transporting animal, again, you want to wear gloves. Uh, you can throw a towel over the animal's head to immobilize it, depending on the animal. Most birds, if you put it over their head, they'll stop squawking or uh, bouncing around. You can scoop the animal up and place an appropriate size container. Place a towel or sheet in the container. An injured animal should not have a lot of space to move around in. If possible, add a heat source. Sometimes they're in shock and they need heat, even though they might not be a baby. Um, again, any one of those sources that I told you, you can call a wildlife rehabilitator. If no one is available, try your animal control officer. So um, Hillary had asked me a really good question um, the other day about if she would want me to, if I had seen an animal not actively be hit by a car. I can't remember earlier so you today. <laughs> You had asked me if I had not seen, somebody called, but they did not actively see the animal get hit by a car. Right, right, right. 
and uh, the person didn't actively see the animal get hit by a car, but they were acting neurological, would I want them to pick up that animal? Uh, no, I would not. Uh, let's just say animal was, um, well, some people, so like this, for example, like where I just told you what to do, um, some people will say like, oh, I just saw this raccoon get hit by a car, like now I'm gonna try to pick it up and bring it to a rehabber. So I wouldn't want you to do that, number one, because it's a rabies vector species, chances are you don't have the proper PPE. Number two, even if it wasn't rabid or distempered and was neurological just from being hit by a car, an animal's response from being in pain is gonna be a lot different than if it wasn't in pain. So you're gonna get bit. So in that case, it's best to call your police department, uh, non-emergency line, and have them dispatch either an officer or your ACO and have them check that animal out. And I think social media has also had an impact as to people thinking it's perfectly fine to go grab that bunny. You know, everybody wants to take a picture. Oh, I found this. Um, or the baby raccoon or, or the squirrel babies. And one, they're not wearing gloves, uh, but they're seeing this in social media every day. Every time I sign on, I see some post randomly from some wildlife page uh, saying, oh, you know, it, it's got a head tilt, but I, I saved it. And she's got a bare hand and it's a rabies vector animal. And I, I just cringe. And that's one of the things that is so important having Erin here is because I think people think it's acceptable to pick up wildlife and they don't realize that if they are bitten, that's, that's the end of the line for that wildlife because dogs and cats, I believe in, not ferrets, but I think in horses, um, they have tested the incubation period uh, for, for rabies situations. And that's usually like if, if Aaron's dog bit me, Aaron's dog would have to do a 10 day quarantine and be perfectly happy at the end of that. And cool, we're all good, we can go our separate ways. However, they haven't done the, the testing on raccoons and foxes to see how long that incubation period is and when they're shedding the disease. So out of an abundance of caution, we want to keep everybody safe and healthy. And if there is that transmission, we can't, Erin can't do her magic. And for that animal too, if that animal is not neurological because of rabies, but then they're going to have to be euthanized to be tested for rabies too. So people, then they get upset, well, why do you have to euthanize them? Because there was an exposure and I have to test this animal for rabies now, which is what people get upset about. But if you hadn't, not touch them without gloves and weren't playing with them, then you wouldn't have this problem. So that's why it's important to get that message out there that you're always wearing gloves when you handle wildlife. So how do you find people um, to help you with rehabilitation? You can go onto the mass.gov site. You can uh, look for people particularly by birds, mammals, reptiles, birds and mammals, whatever, and they will all be there for you. Uh, they just updated the site, so it's really, really nice. And that's it, guys. Does anybody have any... Uh, Questions or, or anything? I know that was like a lot. Yes. What does a bat bite look like? It's so small you probably wouldn't even see it. That's why they all um, bat bites have to be tested in um, houses. So you might be sleeping and it can, it can flutter and get right down to you and, and give you a bite and you might not even wake up. Right. So that's why the abundance of caution. Would you wake up with a teeth arch? Is it a pinprick? Would I know? I mean, you, you might see like a tiny, tiny little, maybe little needle marks. But again, if you were sleeping and you didn't know, and then, you know, you might see two little dots on your, like a little needle, and like not even think, what did that come from? Right. You know what I mean? So you might not even, you might not even see it. Right. And depending on where it is too, like, I mean, let's just say they bit you on the back of your neck too, like you're not even gonna see that. You know, maybe on your hand, when you look at your hand and go, oh, where did those dots come from? I only had one in my whole career where the woman saw the bat fly at her and bite her. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, and she didn't, think, she was outside. 
and it, it took off. So she oh. ended up getting post-exposure yeah, vaccine. Yeah. Um, but I've never had anybody say that I, uh, except for her saying that I, I was bitten by the bat. It's always just the abundance of caution when they're in the house, because you don't know 90% of the time how they got in, when they got in, if your pets or children or anybody else has been exposed. We're not trying to freak you guys out. You're going to go check all your covers today. <laughs> Any other questions for Erin? You've got her. Good. Well, thank you everybody for coming. I hope you enjoyed well, it. Actually, I hope for Hillary, if that's all right. Do you know what happened to the swans on Park Street, that pond there? Oh, they're there. There's only one. No, they're both there. There is? Yep. Yep, they are nesting. They're, they, they are either on the pond during the day and then they are nesting I across the street. I did not see a nest that was all flooded. So there was one day that Aaron messaged me saying, your swans are down by city mills, oh, and which, right. is a, which is attached, as yeah. you know, from all the trails. Um, at this time of year, swans don't behave nicely with each other. Even even the, the married pair. I mean, we all have our, our, our days, right? And they will literally kick the other one out. It just, I mean, I haven't seen them even, I haven't seen two in weeks. I saw two last week. Well, that's yep. good because yep. I know the nest now, when they put it across the street is when COVID year, everybody flocked over there and yeah. drove. Some of them just died because they got separated. And you put that sign up in the poems, and people still just go down there and irritate them. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, as was posted, we will always help any animal that we can, um, whether they are. Uh, an invasive species and non-native, which is what the swan is. They're not even supposed to be in this state. Uh, we will do what we can to preserve the safety of motor vehicles traveling, but we can't stand there and play crossing guard for them. Uh, if, if we did that, we would never be able to sit down and get anything done with our job. If anybody's harassing any wildlife, I would suggest calling the police department immediately because they will send an officer, myself or Aaron or uh, our other mutual aid officer, Casey. And uh, you know, if we can locate the people that are doing it, we will certainly do what we can to to make sure that their existence isn't isn't threatened by us. So hopefully, well, that's good. I thought I hadn't seen them together in so long. I really thought one was gone. So we had one uh, two weeks ago that was over on Miller Street, and remember I told you about him, he was just wandering the road. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an old one that's crippled? Uh, well, the, the, the old one is the one that we took the fishing lure out of. Um, so he will always have a limp. But, really but if, if you think about it, and we all think Bush Pond, Miller Street, City Mills and Mirror Lake and Populatic and Kingsbury, we, we think of that distance as by driving. But it really is as the crow flies. Yes, they fly like B-52 bombers and they need a lot of room to get that lift. But if, if for a lack of a better term, the, the wife swan says beat it, she's going to chase him off the whole body of water until he beats it. And then they try to do a little rendezvous and work it out. But springtime, notoriously, the, the swans are everywhere. Um, and there's, it's, it's chaos in, in every town at that point. We just want to make sure that, uh, one, we don't get involved with the domestic part of it, but two, that um, if they need help wherever they land, we can help them. And just trying to educate people to leave them alone. And, yeah. and swamps inherently can be quite aggressive. <laughs> so you would hope that they would, they would, you know, do a little schoolyard fight on people that are, that are last year, a third one interfered. Mm -hmm. And the old lipping one, like, left the area and was crossing the road. And people were, like, trying to catch him. And I was like, Oh, yeah, I just picked him up. Like, leave them alone. They'll work it out. 
That was Casey that got wind punched by him that day. <laughs> Yeah, and then we had one that the same pond down by City Mills. Um, he was uh, told to leave City Mills Pond by his partner and ended up walking around a property at the top of um, Main Street by Park Street. And I was able to chase him long enough down the side of the road, and it was downhill, thankfully, that he got lift, flew up and around, and then went back to the pond. And I'm like, please work it out. Yeah. Please, please stay where you're supposed to stay. Yes, right in the middle of the road, and people are stopping. And like somebody catch him, and I like stopped and I said, "Don't touch him." Right. If anything, just herd him back. And they're yep. like, "No, he needs a rehabilitator." And I go, "Well, he probably does, but the family needs." He to had rest for 24 hours, and I put him back on the pond. Yeah, I mean, yeah. No. but they were fighting. It's like, just stay out of it. We're not there to. <laughs> Like referee fights, right? You guys. And, and I and I believe again. I think uh, a lot of this is social media driven mm -hmm. because when you see somebody with a post on a community page, I'm not saying Norfolk at all. I'm saying every no, community Norfolk page. Norfolk too. Um, oh my God, help this baby! And if if uh, people aren't giving bad advice, usually they are. Uh, and two, uh, they think it's acceptable that they can just grab everything that they see and they will find the magical answer for it. And unfortunately, there are so many species that we are not allowed to send to rehabilitation. Um, and two, it, it, like with the three-legged deer sometimes, if I look at a, a deer and I realize, okay, it looks like it might be a fracture or a sprain or something like that, we're gonna give this deer the opportunity to do deer things, not to rehab, do deer things because there is no other alternative for that animal. Obviously, if they they can't ambulate, then we're going to step in and do the the second best thing you for them. Leave them alone because there is yes. one in my backyard that and he's really limping, but yep. he has, he's in a group and yeah, as long as he's still they stop and alone. wait for him. Yep, mm -hmm. and he, I mean, he's really yeah. lame. But Fish and wildlife want you to leave these animals alone. Yeah, yes, you have to. What do you? Like you said, there's nothing worse than trying to interfere, and as long as they're moving. Mm -hmm. And they all have a place in our in our ecology. Uh, you know, if you take that that one um, raccoon or coyote yeah. out, of your, <clears throat> out of your neighborhood, it's it's going to be replaced. So it really is, as Aaron said. Uh, the onus is on if you don't want wildlife on your property, you have to make your your property wildlife not friendly, whether it's fencing, whether it's deterrence, whether um, you have to lattice up and chicken wire under your sheds and your decks, that is on, on the homeowner for that. But we only, well, she only inter intervenes with the wildlife when they are injured. Otherwise, it's leave them be. Um, there's a reason why mass wildlife and its population control diseases and 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 different fluxes in different areas. So you start trying to save absolutely everything, there's going to be different changes in the population level. You can't save that. No, you can't save everything. There's some there's some people that that absolutely try. Um, in my opinion, sometimes I find it cruel. You have to to have a, a line of ethics of what is, you know, humane and, and what is not humane. But I am of the um, of the like Hillary said. If it's leave it be, seventy five percent of wildlife that's brought into rehabilitation does not need to be, you know, like seventy five percent of wildlife does not need to be like rehab. People are. It's because people are hitting, you know, people run over wildlife. Like, it, it's all human. People are playing with bunnies' nests. People are um, putting out rodenticide poisoning. People are, it's all human. Like, all this stuff is human. You never saw it when we were kids. Do you guys remember, like, any of this rehab stuff when you were kids? Probably not, right? Because people left everything alone. People weren't. You know, I mean, not to say that people, DDT wiped out everything and then it made a comeback, but you didn't see people, you know, playing with birds' nests and 
bringing in orphan squirrels into the house and playing with bunnies like it just didn't. That's what I'm saying because social media has made it such a big thing to touch everything, like leave it be. It's just desensitization if people keep seeing all their friends or just random people on social media um, saying, oh, well, look, I found this bunny and I nursed it back to health. Everybody thinks that that's, that's okay. And, 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 you know, like bunnies, they end up with, you know, stress myopathy, right? Capture myopathy. Capture myopathy from being anywhere near humans. And their success rate in rehab is incredibly low, right? Uh, just from being scared. So, I mean, it's... Do they rehab pigeons? They do. Pigeons? <clears throat> they do, yeah. Because they can be tame, really. They do. And we had a... At the stadium, we had a wildlife, like, police type come and say they heard that somebody was poisoning pigeons. And I was like, well, I didn't know anything about it. I was like, it just sounds terrible, but they were there to, like, it was like a body of law. They were yeah, the environmental bad. police, probably. Wildlife police, yeah. is that what they were? Yeah. I don't know what ever became of it, but they were like, we heard someone was poisoning them. How, I mean, would you throw food to them that they would eat it? I mean, seagulls cool. the same way? I mean, yeah. do you rehab seagulls? Yeah, with a federal permit you can. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we had one that flew in and we had them all the time, but he had like some kind of something wrapped around his neck and nobody could Probably fishing lure yeah, that people would throw out. Like Again, that. human. Ugh. Yeah, and every once it's in a while, it's right. not really the human, uh, you know, the rare thing. You had your your gull on top of the church who had bad aim and found a lightning rod, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, and that's the second time on that same church. Granted, a human put the lightning rod there, but uh, it wasn't intentional, and obviously you don't want the church to burn down. So, but, uh, you know, 90% of everything that... It is reported um, is probably better off out where it's supposed to be and also when you get the people that are really passionate about getting help for this animal if you tell them that they will uh, call somebody else instead of you or they will try to rehab on their own um, and, and it's it's just a whole lot of education, which is why it was so important to get Aaron because uh, here, because it's bunnies, it's foxes, it's everything is running right now. And this is the time of the year where the call volume, my call volume in the past 10 days has already made up for the past two months. Well, yeah. So it, it's incredibly busy and people genuinely want to help. I'm not saying that they don't want to help, they do. But the best help when that animal isn't injured and just an inconvenience is leave it be, right? I mean, I'd rather call and ask your opinion. That's fine. Oh, yeah. Absolutely call us when you have questions. Like, yeah. What are you talking about? And if I don't know, which is a, a, quite a bit because uh, the calls keep morphing as the years go on, I, if anybody calls my office and says, I need to know what to do, and if I don't have the answer, I'm sending her a, a, an instant message right then and there saying, here's my, here's my hypothetical, what do you think? And then we'll come up with a plan and then call the party back, or if intervention is necessary or exclusion is more appropriate. Um, and we all talk together all the time. So, because if, if I'm on a call and say you have a, a, a raccoon coming at your face, if I'm already tied up, she's responding, or a fox is responding, um, because we're all, we're, we're the vaccinated ones, and uh, I don't believe, I know my police department back in the late 80s, early 90s, they were all vaccinated for rabies because it was so popular back then, everything was coming up positive in the late 80s, early 90s, that everybody got vaccinated in public safety. Uh, that hasn't happened since that time. So will, will the police step in if they have to? 100% yes, 
but I, I would imagine that they might feel a little bit more comfort if one of us who is vaccinated goes in and, and, and does the tango with whatever needs to be tangoed with. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you everybody for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. I hope you answered a lot of your questions. It's great information. Feel free to call our offices anytime if you have questions. Reach out. I'm just happy to help you guys. So, thank you guys. Yeah.